It's my great pleasure to welcome you here for this event. Um, and it's with great joy I look around the room and I see uh, all old friends and new. Um, and so this is, a, this is a joyful occasion. It's also an occasion with some sadness because it's uh, part of our uh, farewell to Dave Schindler, who has been so important to what we do here in the Department of Humanities and so important to the college here uh, at the Loma. And I uh, don't know what we're going to do without him. I had the great good fortune of being part of the committee that, that brought David to Villanova, so <laughs> <laughs> trying not to take his departure personally. But uh, it was something I said a couple of years ago. Um, but this this is a great event, and one, one of the things that makes it great, and one of the reasons I'm going to shut up and sit down very soon, is that this was not uh, our idea. This was a, a student initiated uh, idea to, when they heard that Dr. Schindler was leaving, um, they wanted to hear one last great word. And uh, so without further ado, let me turn the podium over to Rob Duffy, one of our seniors here, who will introduce Dr. Schindler. Thank you all, thank you all for being here in the Humanities Department, who had something to do with putting this together. Well, it's an eight who was the, the uh, idea of our upper limit. Uh, and thanks to Dr. Schindler for agreeing, agreeing to do this for us. Uh, Dr. Schindler will be moving to DC um, in the fall and the summer, maybe, as some of you, most of you may know, uh, with his family. Uh, and he'll be teaching at the John Paul II Institute uh, for Marriage and the Family. He's been teaching at Villanova since 2001 um, and in the Humanities Department since 2004. He took a brief break during that period to accept the Alexander von Humboldt Research Fellowship, which he was awarded for research in Germany that he completed in 2008. This grant eventually led to his most recently published book, The Perfection of Freedom, Schiller, Schelling, and Hegel, Between the Ancients and the Bodies. Dr. Schindler has also published two other books, Hans Urs von Balthasar on the Dramatic Structure of Truth, and the second, Plato's Critique of Impure Reason on Truth and Goodness in the Republic. He has another book scheduled to be published this summer, a collection of essays called The Catholic City of Reason. Dr. Schindler is co-edited Being Only in the World, Theology and Culture in the Thought of David L. Schindler, as well as a Robert Schumann reader of philosophical, sorry, philosophical essays on nature, God, and the human person, which he translated and edited with his wife, Dr. Jean Schindler. That one also comes out this year. He is currently working on the translation of a work from German, uh, whose name I won't try to pronounce, <laughs> <laughs> written by Ferdinand Ulrich. Um, and he's working on a manuscript for a book of his own on the resources for a conception of freedom as actuality in the classical Christian tradition. Dr. Schindler has authored more than 30 articles and 15 book reviews, and has translated or co-translated 12 books and over, and over 60 articles. He is fluent in German and French, able to write in Italian, and can read Spanish, Greek, and Latin. Now, as prolific as Dr. Schindler has been in research and writing, most of us are here because we know and admire him first and foremost as a teacher. I've personally taken or audited six of Dr. Schindler's classes, and they're always full. His energy and passion for philosophy are contagious. He's uniquely able to engage students who are otherwise indifferent to or skeptical of philosophy. But I do not think it's too much to say that he embodies the spirit of philosophical inquiry. Dr. Schindler's impact on Villanova and Humanities Department is far-reaching and will remain when he is gone. Last night at a dinner for the graduating humanities seniors, each of us was asked to name a, a particular humanities moment from our college careers. The first three students uh, to respond recounted experiences with Dr. Schindler that led them to be humanities majors and, that, and to see the world in a new and more beautiful way. Dr. Tom Coe responded before. He ended up saying that many of the stories he hears from humanities students about how they got to where they are today follow this format. I used to be lost. I took Dr. Shinnah's class on beauty for freedom or love. <laughs> and now I see beautiful, free, and lovely the world, how beautiful, free, and lovely the world is. And now I'm beautiful, free, and lovely. <laughs> <laughs> in all seriousness, though, I think many of us can vouch for this experience, having to deeply influence in the way we see the world, ourselves, and one another by the privilege of having been taught by Dr. Schindler. Now, everyone, I turn you over to him. Here is Dr. Schindler to give his last lecture of Villanova, symbolically, called Wonder as the Final Word. So here it is. 
is. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank you all for coming. It's, it's, uh, it's overwhelming. I was worried that no one would show up. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, it's really a, a pleasure to see some faces I haven't seen for a while. Um, uh, so uh, thank you. Thank you for being here, especially at a busy time of the, uh, the semester. And I want to thank um, Nate in particular for uh, proposing this uh, uh, this last lecture, it's a, it's a unique uh, opportunity. One doesn't normally get uh, an occasion to, to uh, make contact with uh, students and, and, and colleagues in a, in a more sort of solemn way uh, at the end and say uh, thank you and, and, and goodbye. So um, I'm, I'm really grateful to have this, this opportunity. Um, my, my, uh, my lecture is called, uh, as Rob said, uh, wonder is the final word. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> uh, when we come to an end, it, uh, it prompts us to uh, recall the beginnings, um, uh, how it all began, how did I get here? Uh, that sort of question has a, um, a more direct sense um, when I think about my experience here. How, how did I end up at, at, at Villanova? And I recall the, the really remarkable convergence of uh, unlikely things that opened a door for me uh, here at the university and then, uh, and then especially in the, in the humanities department. Um, it was a happy coincidence that my uh, teaching fellowship was ending just as this great uh, department was beginning, um, a department that uh, not only connected me with some um, uh, extraordinary colleagues, um, but also uh, introduced me to my wife, uh, the woman who was to become my wife. Um, but uh, coming to an end can also uh, cause one to, to step back even more, uh, uh, even further back, I suppose, and, and uh, reflect even more um, basically about uh, what, what it is that, that, that brought me here. Um, and I'm thinking about the question, what, it is, uh, what is it that, that, that brought me into uh, philosophy in the first place? And that's the question that I uh, want to reflect on uh, with you all here uh, tonight. Um, <clears throat> but reflections on, on beginnings uh, immediately in turn uh, raise a question about the end. Um, as Aristotle, uh, observed, as many of you know, um, the final cause is in fact uh, the first cause because it's the, the end, it's the goal um, that first uh, sets us in motion and in fact uh, directs that motion. Um, uh, it's when we have a purpose in mind or a, a, a goal to aim at that we begin uh, moving in the first place. And uh, moreover, it's the, it's the nature or quality of that end that uh, determines the, the, the quality, uh, the character, the nature, the style of everything that leads up to that end, including the beginning. So you really don't understand the beginning until you reach the end in a certain sense, um, just as uh, uh, you won't ever begin until you have an end. So beginnings and ends are, are interconnected. So what am I getting at here? Um, uh, Plato famously said that uh, philosophy begins in wonder. It's probably a phrase that, that um, uh, many, maybe all of us have heard before. He said that, that uh, wonder is the, the true pathos, the, the, the passion, the, 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 the feeling, the, um, the experience that belongs uh, properly to, to uh, philosophy. <clears throat> Uh, this is a, an extraordinary idea. It's a beautiful idea. It's something that we see um, hanging up in, in philosophy departments uh, all over the world. And um, I would say without any question, it's precisely that that brought me into philosophy, this experience of wonder. Uh, there's no doubt. And I think that's true for everyone who, who begins to philosophize. It's this idea that philosophy begins in wonder is not uh, not really a controversial idea. It's something I think everyone would accept. Um, a more controversial idea, uh, a more controversial question is um, not where does philosophy begin, but where does it end? Um, if wonder is the beginning of philosophy, what's the end of philosophy? Um, that's a little trickier. And uh, Plato, when he uh, makes the statement that philosophy begins in wonder, he doesn't raise that question himself. He gives no answer to it. Um, but if Plato doesn't answer the question, Aristotle uh, does. He, he, he uh, appears, in any event, 
um, to give a clear answer to the question. He said that uh, philosophy ends in knowledge. We start with ignorance um, and we flee ignorance. Ignorance is experienced as a, as, as a kind of a deficiency that causes us to uh, flee uh, toward knowledge. The word that he uses in Greek is, is fugain. It's, it's, it's uh, ultimately uh, related to the word uh, fugitive in, in English. We can think of philosophy as, as a fugitive of, of ignorance. Um, philosophy is the flight from ignorance. Um, but the question is, uh, does Aristotle think that as we approach this end, as we uh, acquire knowledge, does, does he think that we lose wonder thereby? Um, do we leave wonder behind when we, when we uh, come to knowledge? Um, in Aristotle, there's, a, there's an ambiguity there. Uh, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, I think an argument could be made um, uh, on both sides, that, that there is a certain kind of wonder that we leave behind, but it's not clear that we leave uh, wonder behind simply for Aristotle. Um, but if this is ambiguous in Aristotle, <clears throat> and if it's ambiguous in the traditional uh, view of philosophy that he and, and Plato represent uh, most basically, um, the, the ambiguity disappears altogether when you get to uh, modern philosophy. The, uh, the, the major thinkers of the Enlightenment are, are quite clear on this point. Um, you can think, you can uh, consult uh, Francis Bacon uh, or uh, Rene Descartes uh, for some striking statements in this regard. Uh, for the Enlightenment thinkers, the very point of philosophy is to clear away any cause for wonder. Um, that uh, uh, the goal of philosophy is to attain uh, a kind of knowledge that excludes all wonder, um, that they connect clearly with a certain mastery over the world, uh, an ability to um, manipulate the world in such a way as to improve the human estate. And uh, the human estate is improved when there is nothing, that, uh, ultimately nothing that would disturb us, um, that would provoke uh, wonder. Now, if that is indeed the point, um, <clears throat> if that is indeed the end of philosophy, it implies that the, the beginning of philosophy is an imperfection, that the wonder that begins philosophy is an imperfection. Uh, it's a point of departure, and that's it. It is useful. Wonder is something that's useful um, insofar as it sort of gets the intellectual juices uh, flowing, um, but it's meant to be left behind increasingly as we progress. Now, <clears throat> uh, this has always uh, struck me as an inadequate idea, and I, I, I think I'm not, uh, in fact, I, I'm sure that I'm not alone in this. Um, the, uh, the thought of leaving wonder behind simply is, is unbearably sad, um, and I think it's, it's something we can all uh, recognize. Why, why is that? I think we all have a kind of a, an intuition, a sort of a latent sense that the experience of wonder is, is, is in its own way a kind of perfection. Um, on, the un, on the one hand, we can, we can think of the, the excitement that we feel or the joy that we feel uh, when we wonder uh, about something. Um, and it seems to me, on the other hand, um, when we are in a state of wonder, uh, I think we feel like we're doing justice to the world, that somehow being in a state of wonder is being a appropriately respectful of the world. In that experience of wonder, um, uh, we feel especially open to things. Um, uh, we, we, we feel uh, attentive. Um, things uh, uh, attract us and, and draw our interest and uh, they focus our attention. By contrast, uh, without wonder, if we can imagine ourselves without any wonder at all, um, the world would mean nothing to us. We would be closed off from it, um, uh, take no interest in it. And that's, it's hard to think of that state where the world has nothing more to say to us as somehow a perfection, right? So it seems to me that this, this experience of wonder, we, we all have some sense that it is a kind of a, uh, of a, of a perfection. Now, what are we to make of this? What, uh, what does all of this mean? Um, 
I think that we need to uh, reflect a bit about what wonder is. We need, uh, in other words, to wonder for a moment about wonder. Um, <laughs> that was very nice, wasn't it? That was the perfect moment uh, for uh, a, ch a change of perspective suddenly. Um, <laughs> But, but notice, it's when, we wonder, what, when we wonder about wonder, I think it's very interesting. Just sort of attend to yourself right now as you wonder about wonder um, and, and the, the kind of experience you're having. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of a movement that begins. And uh, uh, this, this, uh, when, we, when we wonder in this sort of uh, philosophical way, we don't just stand stupefied, stand agape, uh, uh, you know, glassy-eyed, um, uh, just staring at, at, at something without, without registering anything. Uh, it's not a static experience like that. When we, when we wonder, um, we, uh, we feel drawn into a movement into things. Um, uh, wonder always poses questions. And uh, it poses questions precisely in order to um, get at the bottom of things. We, we, we ask questions in, 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 in order to come to an understanding of, of what's in front of us. And so this, this wondering is actually a movement that's, that wants to bring us, I think, into reality, to, to penetrate it, to try to discover something, uh, something essential. Uh, so if we were to wonder about wonder, we ask, what is wonder and what causes it? <clears throat> So, that would have been a good time for the light change, too. But, um, uh, wonder, uh, it seems to me, is a kind of astonishment and surprise on the one hand. Um, but uh, it's different from just simple shock. Um, uh, because it seems to me that, that, that wonder implies not only this surprise, but on the other hand, also um, uh, a desire, a kind of a positive desire or attraction. When we uh, when we wonder about something, as, as I was uh, suggesting, as we're doing right now, I hope, um, we, we, we're drawn into it. Um, we're, we're drawn towards it. So this, and, and that, that being drawn towards it is a kind of a desire. Um, it seems to me that that movement distinguishes wonder from things like awe or fear or even something more positive like admiration, which is similar to wonder in all sorts of ways. But if you notice, in all of those kinds of things, uh, the experience causes you to step back from something. Uh, uh, wonder is different. It's not, a, it's not a stepping back. It's actually kind of a pursuit, um, a, 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 a call forward. Now, um, this connection of, uh, of wonder with desire uh, calls to mind Plato's description of Eros. In the, uh, Eros, as you recall, is the offspring of Penea and Poros, uh, poverty and plenty. Um, it seems to me that the comparison uh, between wonder and Eros is actually quite apt. Um, uh, desire, Eros, desirous love, as Plato explains in the symposium, is, uh, uh, is impossible without, on the one hand, a kind of a lack. Desire always implies a kind of a lack. It's impossible to desire something that you already possess, he says. Or if you do desire something that you already possess, what you in fact desire is to continue to possess it, uh, to possess it in the future. And that future possession of it is something you don't have right now. So it's still a kind of a lack. And it's impossible to think of desire without some kind of a, of a lack. Now, it seems to me we could say something very similar about wonder. We don't we can't really wonder about something that we've completely figured out. Um, uh, <clears throat> if, uh, if something has nothing more to say to us, nothing more to reveal to us, um, if there's nothing more to learn from something, we can't uh, wonder about it. So in this regard, uh, wonder like desire implies a kind of a lack or an absent, absence. Um, but it seems to me that we can formulate that point that, that very same point in positive terms from the other side and say that uh, wonder implies an excess or a surplus with respect to what we already, already have. And I'll, and I'll be coming back to that point um, as, we, as we go on. Um, <clears throat> uh, what this means is that something can provoke wonder only if I experience it as somehow greater than I am or more than I am or beyond me or different. There's that, that
that space that distinguishes uh, it from me, uh, that it, it must, in a certain sense, uh, transcend me and be different. But, but notice, um, it's, always that, it's always that along with a positive attraction. So it's, it's more and it's other, but in a way that strikes us as good and inviting in some, in some respect. Okay. Um, at the same time, I think that's the, the more obvious aspect of wonder and eros. Um, at the same time, uh, Plato points out something that's, uh, that's, I think, less obvious. And that is, um, he insists that eros, desire, is impossible um, uh, if, if, if it were a total absence, that, that desire can't imply a total absence. Um, as he observes, um, complete and total ignorance, for instance, would never even know that it wants to know. A t complete and total ignorance would imply a kind of indifference to its, its object. Um, you have to know something even to desire knowledge, in fact. Um, and I think that this is true with wonder as well. As I suggested, um, to wonder is to ask questions. But I think we all have the experience that if you don't understand something at all, you find yourself incapable of asking a question about it. Um, that, that, that total lack of knowledge uh, makes your wondering impossible. Um, you need to, to have some help. You need to, to start to understand something in order to formulate the right question. And I have always experienced, and I, I assume this is a general experience, that in fact, um, the more precise a question I'm able, able to formulate, the more proper it is, the more it seems to really get at something essential, the more intense the experience of wonder is, that that, that uh, formulation of the question actually quickens the wonder. It, it deepens or it inten intensifies it. You know, by contrast, the very general question, you know, what in the world, uh, or, or just simply, you know, why, uh, in that kind of open sense. We, we have a sense, it's hard to ask those questions, in fact, with any passion of wonder. Um, uh, they're, too, they're too general and vague, and that, that, that uh, general and vagueness of the question, I think, implies a kind of a weak or diffuse wonder. Uh, so, uh, real wonder implies both a knowing and a not knowing, both a possession and a non-possession, both uh, uh, poros and panea, as Plato said. Um, that, that real wonder is a kind of a paradox. Everybody with me so far? Yeah, all right. Um, now, uh, it seems to me that this, this paradox is often overlooked. Um, there's, a, there's a tendency um, to oppose simply wonder and knowledge. Um, and when we oppose wonder and knowledge, we uh, uh, almost invariably identify um, wonder with ignorance. But I suggested that ignorance is only half of the experience of wonder. So we're associating wonder with only half of itself, you might say. Um, in the modern period and in uh, certain currents of classical philosophy, wonder, as I suggested, uh, has been considered imperfection. Uh, in this case, then, the more we know, the less we wonder. Um, and this, this growing out of wonder in, in these currents is taken to be a sign of maturity, uh, a sign of responsibility. And I'll come back to that point, too. Uh, in the present period, in our contemporary uh, uh, situation, which is often um, referred to as, uh, as postmodern, or um, if you want to be very pretentious, you call it post-postmodern, um, <laughs> But I think it amounts to about the same. Um, in, in, our, in our present situation, there's a dissatisfaction with this trivializing of wonder. And I have suggested at the outset um, that uh, that dissatisfaction is a good thing. It's, 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 an import, it's important to register that. Um, you know, far from becoming mature and responsible, uh, I think we all recognize if we were to lose all wonder, we would become intellectually dead. Um, we would lose the life of the mind, in fact. Now, uh, if it is the case that this dissatisfaction is a good thing um, uh, and important to, to recognize, it's, it's not the case, I think, uh, that the typical postmodern response to this loss of wonder 
is a good one. It seems to me that the typical postmodern response is, is deeply problematic. <clears throat> Why is that? Uh, first of all, um, actually, let me, uh, let me, um, let me suggest uh, uh, why, what postmodern philosophy means by um, saying that uh, uh, what the postmodern response is before I, I talk about uh, the ways that it's, it's problematic. Uh, typically, the response is that if, if, we, um, uh, if in the past we have considered knowledge uh, a perfection and wonder an imperfection, postmodern philosophy really just sort of flips the coin and considers knowledge an imperfection and wonder a perfection. Um, and uh, this, this response comes in all sorts of, uh, of stripes. We see uh, um, uh, uh, a kind of a nervousness about strong claims of reason. Um, we think that in order to save wonder, we need to deny knowledge. We need to reject reason. We need uh, to keep questions open. Um, we need to loosen our intellectual grasp on things. We need to uh, challenge settled beliefs. We need to challenge authority. We need to open, open questions up, open problems up. Uh, we need to relativize reason by subordinating it to something else, to the emotions, to um, uh, maybe uh, mystical experience uh, and what have you. So in, in all of these, we see that there's a, 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 an, an opposition that's maintained between wonder and knowledge, but now instead of emphasizing knowledge, the emphasis is placed on, on wonder. Okay, now as I said, it seems to me that this, this uh, 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 approach is problematic. Uh, in the first, uh, for the, uh, first of all, um, I think and most obviously, it's problematic because it doesn't in fact respond to the problem. It simply leaves the problem in place and flips the coin over. Uh, it's the same false coin now seen from the other side. Um, we leave uh, a, a kind of an opposition between wonder and knowledge and we simply emphasize uh, wonder instead of knowledge. Um, but more profoundly than that, that's sort of the obvious problem with it, uh, more profoundly than that is, uh, it seems to me that this, this approach subjectivizes wonder and it sterilizes it. Why? If knowledge is a, a grasp of things, if knowledge really is a kind of a, a contact with reality, uh, an intimacy with reality, as uh, the traditional um, uh, philosophers uh, said, then uh, the attempt to preserve wonder by denying knowledge is actually, uh, 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 it seals the mind up in itself. Um, it's, a, it's a call, in fact, to, uh, to, to our reason to withdraw from reality, to place a kind of uh, limits or a barrier between our reason and uh, reality. Um, it's a separating of ourselves uh, from any contact. Um, if we make this, ki this kind of wonder that's opposed to knowledge a goal in, our, uh, in itself, we are, um, in fact, denigrating any contact with reality. Uh, and when we do that, what we're doing is uh, we turn what the classical tradition has referred to as the, the, the natural human desire to know, we end up turning that desire sort of back upon itself. We frustrate it. It's no longer allowed to, to, to uh, uh, reach fruition in, in reality, but instead it turns back on itself. We don't ask a question in order to, to, to learn something and find an answer, but we ask a, a question for the sake of asking questions. And this becomes simply a kind of an enjoyment of the spinning of the intellectual wheels. <clears throat> in his book um, on uh, love in the Western world, um, Denis de Rougemont uh, showed that the cult of unrequited love um, that is in the, the tradition of the West, um, he showed that, that that cult of unrequited love paradoxically is a kind of narcissism. It's, it's really, a, I think, a very uh, uh, acute psychological observation. It seems to me that we can make a similar observation about uh, a lot of currents in postmodern philosophy. It's a kind of a cult of unrequited reason. And it seems to me that it runs the same risk of a kind of narcissism. <clears throat> 
Um, so what's the alternative? What's the alternative? It seems to me that the alternative to this is to rediscover reality itself as full of mystery. Um, the uh, fear of reason and knowledge that one finds in, in so much postmodern philosophy, if, if you think about it, it implies that reality is flat and boring, so that if we are to actually come to know it, it would be all over. We would be disappointed. We would be bored. Um, that's implied in this opposition between knowledge and wonder. Um, a response to it then is to recognize that, that reality in its very objectivity is full of mystery, um, that it is uh, super abundantly true um, in a way that represents always uh, an excess over what we have uh, come to grasp. Um, and when we think of reality in, in, in these terms, we discover that in fact, uh, the, the kind of uh, grasp of reality that's implied in knowledge is not, doesn't threaten to kill wonder, it's precisely what uh, multiplies wonder, what fructifies wonder, what provokes wonder. Um, in other words, uh, if we recognize that there is a mystery at the heart of things, then the, the, the movement of knowledge into the heart of things is a movement ever closer to the source of wonder. And what this means is that then the more we know, the more we wonder, the more mysterious uh, reality uh, uh, becomes for us. Um, so conversely, it means that wonder itself is not an empty spinning of wheels, uh, but wonder is, is something that progresses and develops. It's, it's an adventure, right? It's a venturing odd toward, into. Um, it seems to me, uh, my basic thesis here, um, uh, you know, if there's sort of one line that you remember from all of this, the, the basic idea that, um, uh, sort of conviction that I've come to, is that uh, the proper way to understand philosophy, it's, it's not a movement from ignorance to knowledge, although it is in a certain sense. Um, uh, the proper way to understand is that philosophy is a movement from imperfect wonder to an ever more perfect wonder. And that that movement from imperfect to more perfect wonder coincides with a, a movement from imperfect knowledge to an ever more perfect knowledge. And so ultimately, wonder and knowledge coincide. It seems to me, ultimately, um, if we understand reality itself as full of mystery, then um, wonder and knowledge are convertible, convertible terms in a certain sense. Now, um, it's clear, I think, that a, a, a great deal would have to be said to explain what, what do you mean by uh, saying that reality itself is mysterious and what sense of being would we have to have in order to recognize that. And uh, clearly, uh, this isn't the proper place to develop all of that. Um, what I would like to do is just mention three theses from traditional philosophy that support this convergence of wonder and knowledge. Um, so three theses about, about reality, about being, and then I'll mention two um, dispositions, subjective dispositions that we ought to, ought to cultivate in order to preserve the sense of wonder, and then I'll be, then I'll be done. Um, so the, the three themes here. <clears throat> um, the first theme is, uh, a, a, a recollection of the significance of the distinction between being and appearance, which is one of the oldest. It's a distinction as old as philosophy itself. Um, uh, the way that I want to interpret uh, that um, distinction uh, in this context um, is to see it as saying that being uh, always uh, remains more than how it appears. There's always more than we are able to grasp in, uh, in the way that things appear to us. Now, if we interpret appearance to mean, to include not just our sense experience of things, um, but in fact our knowledge, our grasp of, of uh, reality, then this, uh, this distinction between being and appearance means that um, our knowing of things doesn't put an end to uh, what they are for us, excuse me. I noted at the outset that wonder 
requires a kind of an excess, a surplus uh, 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 of reality, a more or greater than. Um, this distinction between be being and, and appearance implies that, that being always remains more than my knowledge. And, and that means that, this, that the, the, the knowledge, the, the reality that I grasp in my knowledge um, can always remain new in some respect for me. Um, knowledge becomes closed in a, in a, in a kind of wonder-killing way only if we separate it from being. And we think of knowledge as something that we have in itself. It seems to me um, uh, the best way to think about this is that, that um, knowledge isn't like a photograph of the world. It's not like a picture of the world that we look at instead of looking at the world. Um, the better uh, way of thinking about it is knowledge is like a window uh, through which we see the world. And so the world is always present. Reality is always present there in a certain sense in in our knowledge if we remain attentive to it. Okay, the second uh, uh, th uh, theme or thesis from uh, traditional philosophy is the classical doctrine of the transcendentals. Um, uh, the students who, who know me know that this is a, a favorite theme of mine. Um, the idea that all being is good, true, and beautiful, that all things that exist uh, share in these qualities in some respect and they share in them to the degree that they exist. Um, now, uh, to explain what that means in this context, of course, just like the first theme uh, would require uh, several books. Um, and uh, uh, I don't want to uh, burden you that much longer with my presence here. Um, but uh, <laughs> I'm just going to make uh, a couple of observations about this, a couple simple ones. Um, and this is, first of all, that this idea that, that being is good and beautiful, it brings that uh, dimension of the attraction of reality that I mentioned at the very beginning as being essential for wonder. Um, uh, to say that all things are, are good and beautiful insofar as they exist means that, they're, that they're, uh, their reality and their, in fact, being real is precisely what attracts us and draws the, us uh, into things. Um, I mentioned that, that wonder has two moments, two aspects. One, it's a kind of surprise, uh, but it's a surprise with, a, with an attraction. Um, if the first theme about the difference between being and appearance uh, uh, sort of grounds that idea of surprise uh, that's always to be had, this, this uh, understanding of the transcendentals shows that, that uh, brings out the, the desirous, the attractive uh, dimension. That the, that the surprise is a worthwhile surprise because there's something, there's something good uh, to be learned um, and uh, ever more to be learned. Um, it seems to me that a, a recognition of the intrinsic goodness and beauty of being is indispensable uh, for a healthy sense of wonder. As for truth, um, the word is etymologically related to trust. <clears throat> um, it seems to me that our, our desire uh, for knowledge um, would be frustrated if we took it for granted from the outset that it could never accomplish anything. And it, it's, it's, it's kind of funny, this, this uh, a postmodern sense of wonder that wants to um, uh, abandon knowledge in order to preserve wonder. Um, insofar as you, you uh, remove the possibility a priori of ever coming to understand um, anything, you actually end up dissolving the root uh, of wonder. It's not just thinking uh, that you know everything that kills wonder, but thinking that you can never possibly ever know anything kills wonder. Uh, and in a certain sense, maybe even more radical way. <clears throat> uh, the third theme is um, the classical doctrine of creation. According to the uh, classical philosophers, the ancient philosophers, um, all things are, are, are caused by something other than themselves. No particular thing is uh, uh, the cause of its own existence. And if that's the case, then in order to have anything at all, we need to move beyond it um, to uh, a, a previous cause. And ultimately, this points the mind to a radically um, other 
uh, uncaused cause, uh, a radically uh, transcendent other that's the source of the world that is. Now, um, again, that's a, a theme that, you know, how many books do we have now that would take another several books to unfold all of the implications. But here I just want to point out that, that uh, the, the very immediate concrete implication of that is that being is a gift. That being is a gift. Uh, that reality is what it is and indeed is at all by virtue of uh, something that lies beyond it, beyond itself. Um, and if this is the case, then the movement into reality uh, that is implied in our, our coming to know things is simultaneously a movement beyond reality to its cause. That that movement to grasp what things are has to move simultaneously beyond it to its transcendent cause. And that twofold movement, I think, is, a, is an intrinsic and constant provocation to wonder. If we think of um, just a normal everyday experience of a gift, um, to recognize that something is a gift, when you think of it as a gift rather than just a thing in your possess possession, uh, you think of the giver, right? To think of it as a gift is to, um, in a certain sense, recognize, acknowledge the presence of the, of the one who gave it in the thing that was given. Um, uh, the giver, in a certain sense, remains present in the gift. If we see reality itself, as a gift, we acknowledge the presence of God within it. And of course, God is an inexhaustible mystery. So to see reality as a gift is to see it as uh, inexhaustibly mysterious and therefore um, never without uh, uh, resources to cause our wonder. It seems to me that the sense of being as gift is the deepest spring of wonder. Now, uh, we all recognize that we're not always mindful of the gifts that we have. There's a, there's a tendency to forget the giver and just uh, become used to thinking of something as belonging to one. Um, and uh, that, that mindfulness that recalls gifts is something that we need to cultivate. If we just let it go, it disappears, it fades away. Um, uh, and that leads me to this last question here. What, what are the kinds of dispositions uh, do we need? Um, to cultivate in order to preserve a sense of wonder um, at reality. Uh, it would be interesting in this context to, to run through the whole um, gamut of, of the traditional virtues, right? The cardinal virtues, justice, prudence, courage, and moderation, and to think of how each one of those has an indispensable role to play in keeping us attentive to reality. We don't think of the virtues in that way typically, but I think we could. Um, and even more basically, the theological virtues, uh, faith, hope, and love, um, as indispensable for wonder. And of course, if we were to uh, reflect on that, love would stand out, right, as the greatest of all the virtues, or as Aquinas says, the form of all the virtues. It would stand out in particular um, if we understand love the way uh, the philosopher Iris Murdoch does uh, a, a, a definition that I, I find really uh, fantastic. She said that love is, quote, the difficult realization that something un other than oneself is real. Um, and I think that difficult realization is, in a certain sense, the key to this whole reflection on, on wonder. Okay, but I'm not going to pursue that reflection. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I want to conclude here just by pointing to two other uh, dispositions that I think need uh, to be pointed to because um, they are increasingly rare today. I think these are precious, precious dispositions that we need to hold on to, uh, to the best of our ability. Uh, the first one is um, an intellectual innocence, an intellectual innocence. Um, I think there are uh, many, many, many forces at work in the world uh, to turn us into cynics. Um, but it seems to me that cynicism is the greatest uh, threat that there is to wonder. Now, cynicism can be caused by all sorts of things. There's a kind of cynicism that grows from a complete mastery. You've mastered everything. Um, uh, you can become then con contemptuous of the, the thing the things over which you are our are, are master. Um, and that's something that we need to be wary of. Uh, of course, 
it's crucial to become, to master certain skills, to, 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 to achieve a, a kind of competence and mastery. But, but that always has to be kept subordinate to a recognition of the ultimate unmasterability of, of, of reality. There's a kind of cynicism that grows um, from what's called the hermeneutics of suspicion, um, that you never take anything at face value. Uh, you always ask the hard questions. You see through things. Um, you don't accept what's given, but you ask the critical questions. Um, why is the person saying what he's saying, um, rather than listening to what's being said? And I think that that kills the spirit of wonder. Um, it's not that, obviously, we need to ask critical questions. We need to uh, take a critical stance. We need to raise uh, doubts about things. Um, but, but that project always has to remain subordinate to a fundamental affirmation of the, uh, uh, of the goodness of reality as it is given. There's a cynicism, finally, that uh, uh, occurs um, uh, as a result of uh, regular experiences, negative experiences that we might have. The experience of suffering, the experience of evil, um, these are things that we uh, read about every day and sometimes uh, experience more directly ourselves. And those kinds of experience can, can lead us to despair of the goodness, truth, and beauty of things. Um, and uh, the moment we despair, again, I think we've lost uh, the resources for wonder. Uh, clearly, again, we need to, we can't be naive about the evil in the world, and we can't be, we can't hide from it, um, but I think we need constantly to keep in mind that uh, evil is never the last word. Um, we need constantly to keep in mind that the world has been created uh, and redeemed uh, by a good God, and that that is the, the ultimate truth uh, of things that trumps every other truth, it trumps every other uh, bad experience, it trumps all mastery and um, doubt and suspicion. <clears throat> it's not an accident that we associate innocence with childhood and childhood in turn with the experience of wonder. Um, there's a certain tension in being educated into mature and responsible adults um, on the one hand and preserving a childlike sense of the world on the other hand. But um, it's a tension. It's not a contradiction, it seems to me. Um, Jesus uh, said um, that one enters into the kingdom of heaven only as a child. Um, and I think that um, one could say, in fact, Plato says something similar to this in one place. But you could say that one, can, one enters into philosophy, one enters into the experience of wonder only as a child. Um, ultimately, I think that heaven is a kind of... Uh, simultaneity, perfect simultaneity of wonder and knowledge. At least that's what I hope as a philosopher. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but finally, uh, the second disposition is uh, to cultivate a spirit of gratitude. A spirit of gratitude. Um, if the sense of being as gift is the greatest source of wonder, then of course the most important disposition to cultivate is this one. Um, in the world in which we live, in which achievement and uh, change is prized above all other things, the spirit of gratitude can easily be trampled down and uh, stifled. Um, it seems to me in order to keep our eyes open in wonder, we have to recognize that in the end, ultimately, what we have received is uh, greater and more important uh, than anything that we've achieved. <clears throat> uh, but cultivating a spirit of gratitude is easy, uh, by contrast, when you are surrounded by reasons to be grateful. And on that note, um, I want to express uh, my gratitude uh, to all of you. Um, <clears throat> all the students I've had over the uh, 12 years, it's hard to believe it, 12 years that I've been here. <clears throat> um, I haven't had all of you for 12 years, in fact, you know, <laughs> most of us. There are few things in the world that are more, uh, more beautiful um, than uh, sharing excitement over an idea or an author uh, with a student. Uh, it's, it's really extraordinary. And that's something that I've um, <clears throat> had the, uh, the good fortune of experiencing every, every semester uh, since I've been here. Um, <clears throat> 
I want to express uh, gratitude uh, also to the university um, <clears throat> and uh, my colleagues at the university uh, in, in general for the, for the generosity, respect to the, the conversations. Um, and I think above all, uh, the, the model um, that my colleagues have, have uh, presented of uh, teaching, not just as a job, as a, as a, as a, but as a real vocation. I think of, of uh, running into uh, Earl Bader in the early mornings, uh, uh, most days, um, uh, with his hands full. And this look of, of uh, uh, kindness in his face uh, uh, with also a kind of an inspiration and determination, and I think, okay, that's it. That's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what we are aiming at uh, as teachers. Um, uh, but above all, I want to express my gratitude to the Humanities Department. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it's been a privilege uh, to, to be a part of, of something that aspires to a uh, a lofty ideal of what education is, um, and uh, in resistance to uh, the cultural cur currents that, that try to trivialize it. Um, it's been a rich and beautifully uh, humbling blessing to pursue my work, uh, surrounded by uh, uh, colleagues that, that are amazingly talented um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, too uh, radiantly uh, good, um, who <clears throat> Uh, yeah, we need to change the lights again. <laughs> uh, radiantly good, who, who, who really uh, live the kind of intellectual innocence and, and uh, spirit of gratitude that I spoke about. I think um, this combination in... <clears throat> um, excuse me. <clears throat> I think this combination in the teachers is one of the things that has... Uh, continue to to attract the uh, students of such great quality um, that the humanities department uh, does uh, year after year, and I think it's also um, <clears throat> one of the reasons uh, that that uh, all of the events that the humanities department holds um, uh, there's always a, a deep current of joy, <clears throat> and I think that that's really a remarkable and a, and a precious thing. So. In the end, um, I want my final word to be not a wonder, actually, um, but a word that's inseparable from it. Uh, thank you. Thank you.